Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Kyber Labs. In today's video we're going to be talking about the production of radioisotopes. So we're going to um, have a look at what we mean by transuranic elements in the periodic table. We're then going to look at um, some of the technology that's involved in producing radioisotopes called particle accelerators. So the different types of particle accelerators, linear and accelerators and cyclotrons, and also the types of collisions that we might be undergoing in a particle accelerator. And then looking at the process called neutron bombardment that we can use to produce radioisotopes. Um, so either looking at nuclear fission or particular radioisotopes being made, as well as looking at one such facility here in Australia called the Opal Reactor in Lucas Heights in Sydney. So when we're having a look at our periodic table here, this is the most up-to-date version um, based on our, our new, newly confirmed elements. When we're talking about transuranic elements, we're specifically referring to the ones that are highlighted here in blue. That is, they're elements that have an atomic number, or Z, greater than 92. Now remember that these the, the two rows at the bottom, that are lanthanoids, or lanthanides, and our actinides, these ones here, um, both fit into this kind of area of the periodic table. So actually that, you know, that um, we have lutetium and lawrencium that fit directly underneath scandium and yttrium, and that these two rows kind of connect in together. So basically once you, once you look at the complete periodic table, it's the bottom row, um, or kind of the, 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 the right-hand side of the bottom row. So once you take that into account, so it's um, elements that are beyond uranium, transuranium. So transuranic. So when we think about these are the elements which are all man-made. Okay, but um, we also have technetium, which is the which is the kind of the odd one of the odd one that out that's that's kind of below 92. But 92 as uranium is the heaviest naturally occurring element. Anything that is heavier than that um, was artificially produced. Okay, so we're talking about how do we artificially produce these types of elements? So one of the techniques that we use is called a particle accelerator. Okay, because if we're trying to produce elements that are heavier, we're needing to add particles into the nucleus. Okay, specifically, we're trying to add in um, protons, and in order to make the nucleus stable, we also need to add in neutrons. Okay, so that um, the, the reason, so we're starting from that premise that we're trying to add in additional particles, particularly protons, which are positively charged. However, so if we think about our approaching kind of proton, or something here, that the idea is that as it's approaching the nucleus, that it's going to be repelled by that nucleus because they're both positively charged. Okay, that you, you, you have a, a practical limit to how closely those particles can get before then they force each other away. Okay, that force of repulsion is very strong at that level um, because of the quantum behavior of atoms. So the idea is that if we want that proton to not only kind of make contact, but then make contact in a way that makes it stick and stay into the nucleus, we need to slam it into the nucleus at an incredibly high speed, incredibly fast, so close to the speed of light in many, um, for, for many sort of situations. Okay, if we want that collision to, you know, to be able to overcome that repulsion so that then it can actually collide with that really tiny, dense nucleus in the middle. And so if we need ultra high speeds, which overcome that repulsion, which kind of, you know, it's going so fast it can't be pushed away in time, we need to use tech, new technologies to be able to make that happen. And a particle accelerator is one such way to do that. Okay, so there are two types of particle accelerators that we will use. The first one is called a linear accelerator. So what it does is that you can see, so if you have a look at this little diagram over here on the left, so we start off with a place where we inject our um, our, our particles to start with. And what happens is that they're going to travel along this, they're going to travel from left to right. And what we do is that we've got, these are positively charged particles, and we've got these alternating kind of bands of um, different voltages, positive and negative, as you go, as it progresses through. So this is the particle beam that's continuing out the other side. The idea is that the, the, the alternating voltages here, it's very deliberately designed to help propel that particle along. Okay, using an electric field so that it's repelled by the positive charge and attracted towards the next negative charge. Okay, and then it can pass through and then it's repelled here and pulled along here. So the idea is that it's continually being pushed and pulled, um, attracted and repelled in order to continue moving in a straight line very, very fast. Okay, but because we have to do it in a straight line and we need it to build up in a very, very large amount of speed, 
that these um, linear accelerators tend to be very, very long. Certainly if we want to achieve speeds close to the speed of light. Okay, so this is kind of an example of, um, of one such linear accelerator. Very, very long constructions in order to reach the speeds that we need. Okay, and in order to actually max out at, at you know, extremely close to the speed of light, um, like in, say, the Large Hadron Collider in Europe, we've had to make it about 27 kilometres long. Okay, so it's, it's curved in order so it actually can continue around and continue to build up speed. But that is a very, very large um, area, you know, under, underneath lots of really populated areas or, you know, kind of important areas in Europe to make it long enough to get speeds close to the speed of light. This is the fastest we can manage, but it's, you know, this has taken billions of dollars to be able to construct this. And here's kind of a view from the inside of a section of the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, now obviously we don't, you don't have to use the Large Hadron Collider to be able to form radioisotopes for what we need, but it is one sort of way that we can take the concept and max it out to get the, the maximum effect. So, you know, where they're taking protons and they're smashing them into each other to see what happens and, and understand more about the particles inside the atom. The other type of technique we can use, um, because, you know, if, if the linear accelerator has to be really long, it might be, you know, a kilometre long. That's not always very practical, especially if we're only trying to work on a small scale. So what we can do is we can actually use what's called a cyclotron. So cyclo being round, okay, so it, it, instead of following a linear path, we can get our target, our, our ions, to actually follow a circular or a spiral kind of path. So where we're starting in the centre here, and then they're progressively, you know, moving in a spiral that circles further and further out, till eventually we get it to the spot where it's going to bombard into the thing that we are after, the target nucleus. Okay, so the target would be at the end here, okay, and so by accelerating the particle faster and faster and faster, and then we release it so that it collides in here, we then can, um, we can then get the, um, the substance that, that we're after. Okay, so that we're using various combinations of magnetic fields to be able to accelerate that particle um, and produce, in, so in a curved path, and then produce the isotopes that we need. Okay, so this is an example of the one that is in um, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney. Okay, so it's still very large, it's the size of a room, but it's, that, that is much more practical to be able to produce um, than something we have to be a kilometre away to, to get it. Okay, you can, the logistics of that. So um, in both cases that we're colliding all sorts of particles. Okay, so that we're typically combined, we're, we're firing protons, alpha particles, or smaller nuclei at a target element. And so, when we're looking at a collision with protons, they're like, the, for the example, of producing iodine-123 for cancer treatment from xenon-124. So this undergoes kind of three sort of steps to produce the, um, the radioisotope we need. Firstly, we're bombarding um, xenon-124 um, with a proton. What it does is that that forms um, cesium-123 and spits out two additional neutrons. Cesium-123, um, which then undergoes two stages of positron emission um, in order to decay down to iodine-123. Okay, so it's maintaining the same mass number, but it's decreasing, um, it's decreasing its atomic number by two to go from cesium back to xenon and then to iodine again. Okay, so it needed to go through this process so we could turn one isotope into the next. So you'll see with these sorts of things that they often form a fairly complicated um, pathway to get where we need to go. Okay, we can also collide with alpha particles and the smaller nuclei to produce larger and larger isotopes. Okay, so the, this is what we're needing to be really pushing the boundaries of our new elements, um, colliding them, you know, with, with larger and larger projectiles. Okay, so we can form curium-242 from taking plutonium-239, which is just larger than uranium. Okay, so we can take plutonium, um, which has a very long half-life, so it, even though it's radioactive, that we do have samples we can work with. We can bombard it with alpha particles to form curium um, and then spit out an additional neutron. So often you'll see with, from the collisions, it's like if you imagine two cars colliding at high speed, that sometimes additional particles come off as debris, if you like, um, and as to help conserve um, conserve mass. Okay, and then likewise, thinking about smaller nuclei, this is how we produced our four most recently discovered elements, Moscovium, Nihonium, Tennessine, and Oganesson. Okay, so Moscovium-288 was produced from taking Americium-243 and colliding it with a Calcium-48 nucleus. Okay, so a much larger projectile, the sort of thing that we would need in order to increase our atomic number by such a large amount. Okay, so we're taking this collision and then we formed our Moscovium-288 and three neutrons in the process, okay? Now, this Moscovium decayed, you know, 
less than a second later, it was gone, but it was there and it was detected. And that was enough to be able to identify that it was made. Okay, now we're having a look at the second aspect, which is called neutron bombardment. So rather than, we can produce radioisotopes, if we're not trying to increase the atomic number, we can bombard it with neutrons instead of something that has protons in it. That has some distinct advantages um, for a different substance because neutrons are not repelled by the nucleus because they have no ch electric charge. Um, they can collide with the nucleus without any of that repulsion, which means then we can conduct them inside a nuclear reactor without any high speed required. Okay, so this is, the, this is a cross section of the core of our nuclear reactor. Um, so where you've got fuel rods, such as like uranium-235, that are a source of neutrons, um, that then we can channel to, um, so the, the neutrons that have been given off by these fuel rods, we can channel into radioisotopes that we're after. Okay, so inside the reactor, you notice that we have these control rods. Their function is designed to absorb extra neutrons to keep the, the reactor core stable, but we can use these neutrons for other purposes as well. Okay, so... The, the first kind of aspect of neutron bombardment that can be useful, but is a little more unpredictable, is for nuclear fission. We're taking a neutron and, co and, and colliding it with a nucleus in such a way that it splits into two smaller sections. But the problem is, and, and then you can see, because we're giving off two extra neutrons over here, that it needs careful control to not become an out-of-control uh, chain reaction like would happen in a nuclear weapon. Okay, because if we just left, leave this unchecked, then both of these neutrons can then collide with with um, extra nuclei which split and then two becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, 32, etc. It exponentially increases and, and a significant amount of energy, 200 million electron volts of energy is a huge amount at this, this scale. Um, so that yeah, this process needs careful control so that we're channeling the neutrons into um, radioisotopes or we're using them carefully to cause the fission that we're after. So we could do it so that, um, you know, if we wanted barium-139, we could do this process. The reason it's not always very reliable is that we don't have any direct control over exactly what nuclei results from the fission. It could be barium and krypton, it could be strontium and something else. Like, it, it, there's not necessarily um, a clearly defined boundaries as to how this nucleus will split. It all just kind of depends on lots of variables. Um, but it can be done. The other thing that can be done, which is more what we're interested in, is we can actually produce specific radioisotopes by colliding neutrons with a, tar a specific target nucleus that might be stable to form something that's unstable or radioactive. Okay, so we're, you know, so for example, taking cobalt-60, we can produce it from cobalt-59, okay, so which is more stable. We add in one extra neutron to produce the cobalt-60 that we need for cancer treatment or for industry. So that extra neutron helps to change the properties enough to make it useful for what we need, um, but we could do it in a controlled way. We're introducing a specific target to get a specific outcome. Um, so one such facility that we can use here in Australia, or in, in Sydney more particularly, is called the Opal Reactor, um, which is in Lucas Heights. So here you can see kind of looking down into the water-cooled core, so the fuel rods are kind of just down below here. You can kind of see them from the, like if you were here, you'd be able to look down into it to see that image. Um, so it's only, it's a nuclear reactor, but it's only for the production of radioisotopes. It's not for nuclear power. Um, it is only designed to actually produce these sorts of things. So it can still contains fuel rods, um, but using the neutrons for producing um, substances like technetium-99. Okay, um, and using the, new, um, the fission of uranium-235 as a source of neutrons for what we need. Okay, so we identified um, what we mean by transuranic elements. We talked about um, one of the we, that there's two ways to produce them using a particle accelerator um, and using neutron bombardment. Particle accelerators to overcome the repulsion of the positive projectiles from the nucleus of our targets. We can have them in a straight line. We can have them in a cyclotron, which is circular, um, and we have a range of different types of collisions that we can do: protons, alpha particles, and small nuclei. Or we can use neutrons to bombard target atoms. Um, to either produce radioisotopes or cause nuclear fission. Um, and one such facility is at the Opal Reactor at Lucas Heights. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.